What is up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the Two Game Podcast. We are here continuing our deep dive into the Lord of the Rings franchise. We have done both trilogies. It is time to jump into the Rings of Power. This is a show that I personally, I watched an episode and a half when it first released, and I fell off of it for, for many different reasons, but I fell off of it. So, we are doing this. We are going to break up the first four episodes in this part, and then we're going to come back in two weeks for the final four episodes or the uh, the back half of season one. We are going to be deep diving into all of episodes one, two, three, and four on this particular episode. We're going to be talking anything and everything. We're going to try to keep spoilers, so if you've watched episode one, you can pause it and not hear spoilers for episode two, three, and four if you uh, so choose to do that. Uh, but we are also going to prevent spoilers from episodes 5 through 8 as well. Uh, so, Creston and Nick are joining me today. Welcome back, uh, gentlemen. Howdy, howdy. Hello. It's almost here, guys. We're almost done. We have two more episodes, counting this one. So, so yeah. Season For 2. Now. September. Until, yeah, season two comes out, and then we can just do episode by episode. Have they have they released a date for season two yet? Not yet. I've just heard that it's going to be September. Didn't they also just recently announce though that uh, season three has been greenlit? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Which uh, bodes well for the show, I have to say. So before we jump into the deep dive. Uh, Like I said, we are going to be expanding on all these episodes, giving our thoughts and opinions as we recap each episode. We're going to be using the lore and the the lore of the books to kind of fill in the gaps within uh, or give some of the context behind some of the scenes within the show. Uh, I personally need some of that context, so hopefully this will be uh, some good for all these people out there that are maybe not the biggest Lord of the Rings fans, but... They're like casual fans. Uh, But before we jump into the episode, there are links down below. You can jump into all of our social media accounts. Like, follow, subscribe, do all that bullshit. Really helps us out. And we would greatly appreciate it if you supported us at all those links. Uh, And there's also links to our Patreon. Patreon.com slash 2game. And like I said, that helps us uh, financially each and every single month. We would greatly appreciate it if you supported us that way. Uh, that helps us make better content for y'all, and it also keeps us going with the podcast. Uh, but without further ado, let's jump into The Rings of Power. Again, episodes one through four, full spoilers for the episodes from here on out, so this is your last chance. One thing I want to do before we actually start recapping uh, episode one. I want to set the table for what Rings of Power is going to be moving forward. Okay, what what should people expect from this show? What kind of stories and characters are we going to be going to be seeing? So, right off the gate, Morgoth is mentioned in this episode. Okay, uh, from y'all, I, like I said, I kind of talked to y'all before we even started recording to keep spoilers at a minimum past episodes episode four who is Morgoth okay so let's let's kind of talk about him for a second kind of set the stage uh, for people that are maybe not uh, huge fans of the of the books Morgoth is essentially the uh, the guy before Sauron right yes yeah. one of the original Valar Valar <clears throat> okay I guess uh, what do we say like demigods Demigod. Yeah. So you've got Elu Iluvatar, who's the almighty. God. Yeah. God, yeah. The one. And then his, well, we could call them archangels, maybe, if you want to go with the Christianity route. So you got Iluvatar, who's God. Then you have the Valar, which would be either the demigods or the archangels. And then you have the Maiar that are underneath that, which are your... Angels, essentially. And the Maiar study under Valar. And Morgoth was a Valar. Gotcha. Uh, 
We did we did kind of break that down just a little bit. And I think it was in uh, episode oh, one, Fellowship yeah. of the Ring. Fellowship, whenever you were talking about Sauron and Saruman. Yes. Uh, so the this is essentially the war before the war in Fellowship. The the intro sequence, correct? Allegedly, this is yeah, allegedly lead up. So, we'll, we'll, before we even dive into the lore and everything else, we'll 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 talk about the premise of the show, or n- not even the premise of the show, but the uh, the content of the show. So Tolkien wrote essentially four pieces of work. There was a lot more than that, but essentially four pieces of work to work with. You got the Hobbit, you've got the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which was really written as one book. And then at the end of the Lord of the Rings trilogy is the appendices. And then you have the Unfinished Tales and the Silmarillion. Amazon only has rights, television rights, to the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings series with the appendices at the end of it. Nobody has rights to the Silmarillion or to the Unfinished Tales. Which is where a lot of the hate from this show comes in at is because they're trying to make a story on very little literature. Yeah, and they're working with what they got, though. Right. They are. And that's... It that's fucked that they don't have the rights to it because... It, yeah, it does. And it's so... Stuff in there. Especially the Silmarillion. Right. So they're trying they're trying not to write another Lord of the Rings movie, essentially. Mm-hmm. So they're really working with the appendices at the back of the book to try and create a story. That's fair. That's fair. All right. So episode one, Sauron gets mentioned by Gladriel. Uh, what is his, I guess, place in this story? Uh, prior to prior to episode one, like what is like, is he something that all the people around the world fucking know about, and they're like scared of him? Is it kind of like uh, Voldemort, where they're like, "Fuck, we don't talk about him, but he's fucking there," kind of thing, or is he just like this rumor amongst like a like a group of people, or you know, he so would, to speak? He would be essentially going the Game of Thrones route. He'd be the hand of the king. Yeah. Morgoth got defeated, was cast into the void. Sauron was told he needed to go before the Valar um, and decided to run into hiding. So, in years, a lot of people have either forgot or just don't think he's around more. Um, but that's kind of like the, the pretense to where he's at right now. All right, so everybody knows him. It's oh, just, he's like he's off in the background, trying to be like Voldemort, trying to get stronger and shit. Right. He was he was Melkor or Morgoth's number number two in command, so everyone knew who he was because you know the War of Wrath and all that good all that good jazz. Okay. So I think uh, also the last question, which I think. I mean, I kind of know the answer to this already. Uh, the rings are not forged at this point in the story, correct? Otherwise, Gladriel would have a ring. Well, the the timeline on making the rings is a little different from the books, but in short, yes, the rings haven't been created. It can, I, I guess it depends on what part of the story from the books they're starting at. But as far as when they built... Um, the forge in Oregion, the rings haven't been made yet. Okay. And this, this might be a future spoiler. I guess, I guess it's just a, a thing that I'm kind of just throwing out there into the void. Okay. And fellowship, they say they all made rings of power, right? And then secretly Sauron created a one ring to rule all the rings, correct? Yes. Yes. So nobody actually knows because it's a secret, correct? When they're making their rings, he's over here like, 
I'm good. I'm just gonna make my own shit myself. Well, I mean, it's kind of like a two way street, though. They made the rings. Sauron secretly made the one ring, and it could control the minds of the other people that were wearing the original rings. But the elves were acutely aware of that once he put the one ring on. So they took them all off, you know, disbanded, uh, hid them, okay. and then they made their three elven rings. So in the. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> That hasn't happened yet. We'll get to it. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> trust, trust me, guys. I, I, uh, I had a little, like I said, we had like a little talk beforehand. I'm like, we, I'm gonna be asking questions. And you got, most that's of a real rhetorical. <laughs> Chris is about to go on a fucking roll here. Let me, really let me just tell really? you the entire story, okay? <laughs> All right. So I think that kind of sets the stage for kind of the the basis of where we are when the show starts. So now yeah. we are going to start recapping. So, yeah, this show this show is covering about 3000 years worth of timeline. Um the way it's been portrayed thus far is that 3000 years has been condensed into one linear timeline of everything going on at the same time. Yeah, so what show was it? It was uh The Witcher was doing multiple timelines and it was so fucking confusing. So it this was is all and happening at the same exact time. That's what it seems like. It doesn't seem like because you go back and you watch The Witcher season one and you're like, okay, yeah, I'm picking up where we're in the past or in the future or in the present. This one, it seems like everything is happening at once. Yeah. I had a reach a lot of these events have taken place over thousands of years apart. Ah, uh, okay. All right. That's that's very important information. It's one fast moving timeline, just like you like, Matt. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever gets me to the finish line the quickest, boys. <laughs> All right. So after the Dark Lord Morgoth is defeated, the elf Finrod dies searching for Morgoth's servant, Sauron. Finrod's sister, Galadriel, vows to continue the search and finds an abandoned fortress in the northern wastelands of Forwardwaith, which I probably said that wrong, whatever, uh, which bears Sauron's mark. All right, so right off the bat, now we're going to be, like I said, I'm going to be jumping in in and out of the actual storyline pretty pretty frequently and pretty fast because there's not a whole lot to recap in, in each individual episode. So right off the bat, and I think everybody can agree with me on this, this looks... 1,000 times better than the Hobbit trilogy ever did. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Just visual fucking ropes. Oh. Just absolutely <laughs> magical. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> from from the special effects, just overall, how, like, the, how the, the world looks. And Absol the thing that I noticed in episode one were those striking, like, images that they were able to to put on, like even like the cinematography, was oh. just out of this fucking world. Yes, no, compared, to, compared to the Hobbit. Yes, compared to yeah. the Hobbit. But I will say the the one person that this kind of reminded me of, and I'm not saying the properties are are similar by any means. So don't come at me in the comment section or or shit like that. Okay. And by by far, this is much better than a lot of what this director does. Yeah. Zack Snyder, if anything, he doesn't do a great job of developing characters in a lot of his movies. But there's one thing that motherfucker can do. He can create an image. <laughs> and it, this the episode, specifically episode one, reminded me a lot of that. Because we have, like, the... the the scene of the thousands of helmets piled on top of each other or, you know, like the dead people floating in like the, the blood stained water, uh, or even like some of the imagery revolved like around Gladriel climbing the snow covered mountain. This just leaps and bounds just better than anything in the Hobbit trilogy to me, like even with the special effects. Now, granted, granted, uh, how much did they make this show for? Like a lot of fucking money. Like a, it, was, it was a bunch of money, wasn't it? It was. Uh, they well, they spent a lot of money just to get the rights. Yeah. 
So, whew, I mean, it looks good at least. But I mean, when we get <laughs> further into the uh, to the <coughs> into the episodes, Nick and I have kind of already briefly discussed. Like y'all did, y'all spent all this money on this to make it look really good, but y'all kind of skimped out on this this shit over here. So we'll kind of dump, dive into that uh, here shortly. So you got Snyder vibes from the first episode or the first 10 minutes of the episode. I got Underworld vibes. Ooh. Nice reference. I, yeah, yeah. Especially in the uh, the Dark Fortress, for sure. Mm -hmm. When she fucking ran up and jumped off the blade. and I, I got a lot of Underworld vibes. The Underworld 1 vibes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we don't talk about the other ones. <laughs> Can I just Rise, say? Rise of Lycans was good. Yeah, yeah it was decent. Okay. Can I just that was, say? That was, that was a pretty good one. Yeah. Galadriel, Anything? dime piece. <laughs> Bruh. I don't know. We've already had this discussion, me and Primo, about um, we're, we're, we're missing the old school. I mean, he, okay. I, I am. I always have a sweet spot in my heart. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm fucking, I'm progressive, sir. <laughs> uh, I, I will say this. Like, I'm not to future spoil anything or anything like that. Like, she has grown on me. In more ways, more maybe. Uh, as yeah, we have gotten through each episode. Like, in episode one, I'm like, I mean, you're not Kate Blanchett, man. You're just not. <laughs> But again, you you know you, you're you're still bringing those biases into yeah. it. I feel like they huge. did a good job of because there was a, probably a lot of fans that came into this kind of uh, pessimistically, not saying any names, you know. But uh, I feel like this show was able to break those <laughs> those uh, thought processes. I'll tell you, I was extremely open minded about this series, and so, and I made the comment. I no, no, no. I was. I legit. Like, I sat up. Uh, my parents were in town. I don't remember if it was when Linus was sick or whatever when the show came out. And my parents were in town. And my dad and I stayed up for, like, four hours watching the series when it first came out. And I loved it. And I still don't hate it. And the uh, all the Facebook groups you've put me in in the past oh, couple months. Fucking dude. awesome, brother. God damn. I'm sitting there watching the comments on this show. I'm like, these guys, you know, we talk about Star Wars being a toxic fan base. Jesus. Lord of the Rings <laughs> people are a toxic fan it's base. Fucking ruthless, man. God damn. It's, on, it's honestly depressing sometimes to even get on there. Like, <laughs> right. bro, give it a fucking rest. Right. I got to say, I'm surprised, though. I'm surprised, sir. I'm I, proud of you. I love Lord of the Rings. Hobbit, had they done things differently, I would have loved it. This one, I, and it might be that I'm just not extremely deep in the lore. I did not bother with the appendices. I have not read the Unfinished Tales. I have not read the similar, similar yeah, whatever, yet. Even though you gave it yeah. to me. It's sitting in my backpack. I got two copies, so you can you can keep that one as long as you need to. <laughs> so you maybe can... it's because I'm not as interested in the lore. <laughs> yeah. No, I haven't read the appendices either. I've read the, uh, the Unfinished Tales and the Silmarillion, but it's definitely on the list now, for sure. I yeah, feel like I'd actually... Right, go ahead, Preston. Sorry. But... No, go ahead, man. No, I, my... Not important. What were you saying? I was going to say it's probably a lot of redundant information, but it would still be nice to go through it. I'm sure there's some little, uh, you know, some small gems in there. I had texted uh, Creston, uh, was it yesterday or something like that? I was asking him some questions. Oh, it was about the uh, the lineage, which we will... That's kind of a spoil for another episode. Uh, uh -huh. Hold that thought, guys. <laughs> but my point is, I had texted Creston. I'm like, there is so much fucking bullshit. Like, I, I don't think I will ever catch up to, to you two. And he's just like, yeah, uh, I'm still learning shit. <laughs> every time, like, dude. Every that makes time me sad. YouTube video uh, or reread one of the books, I'm fucking learning shit. It's crazy. Uh, so much information. 
I, I go on those Facebook groups to answer questions that people have sometimes, and then I get blasted. I'm like, I thought I had it right. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Dangerous. <laughs> Afterwards, Nick has to show us on the teddy bear where he got touched inappropriately. <laughs> then, then I make redactions in future videos about I fucked up, guys. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> From the group's gonna see this, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> oh. So, continue on with the uh, with the episode. Uh, her companions insist on returning to the elven capital, Linden, where High Elf Gilgalad proclaims the war against Morgoth's forces to be over. He grants Galadriel and her company the honor of sailing to Valinor, where they can live an eternal life at peace. Uh, in the southlands of Middle-earth, elves watch over men descended from allies of Morgoth. Uh, to the disapproval of the other elves and men, the elf Arondir has grown close with the human healer, Bronwyn. Together they discover that the village of Hordern has been destroyed, while Bronwyn's son Theo finds a broken sword bearing Sauron's mark. Near Valinor, Galadriel chooses to turn back and continue the search for Sauron, jumping from the ship into the Sundering Seas. Uh I'm gonna say, I don't I don't know if she thought that the the whole way through, you know? Like you're you're far out there. <laughs> Yeah, they were at the fucking gates. <laughs> I'm right. back. I'm like, you got a long swim back. <laughs> like, bro, you you didn't think about this <laughs> like like five days ago when you were traveling? Huh? At the same time, two Harfoots, Nori Brandyfoot and Poppy Proudfellow, discover a strange man inside a meteor crater. Uh to me. They do a good job with the score. Uh, this kind of that's kind of the end of episode one. Uh, they kind of do a good job of with the score, the storytelling, and the editing here to kind of make you interested in like a second episode. I don't think this episode necessarily hits on all cylinders because it does feel kind of hit and miss, but it strikes that intrigue. You know, it makes me interested, and with what's going on here, I'm like, the fuck? They just a meteor man? Uh, okay, like I will. Watch well, the next episode, got... sure. Where the fuck are they going? Uh, one thing I will say is very much lacking so far, and this is what Nick and I kind of discussed earlier. You spent so much money on this show to look good, but the costume designs just don't are just not up to par with the OG trilogy, or maybe even the uh, the Hobbit trilogy to to some extent. Um, I just I don't know what it is about the costumes that just turns me off. They just look weird. It's like going from Mortal Kombat to Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Bro, I enjoyed the costumes. Really? I mean, okay. especially, well, I, it's kind of jumping ahead, but especially the other races. No, no, no. I, I will give you that. But I, more specifically talking the elf costume. You're talking about like the elf battle costumes when they're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ar the the armament, the battle, you know, the battle gear and stuff like that, and even the tunics and stuff seem very thin. I I don't really care for all the like you said, Nick, the uh, the elven armor and shit like that. It's the Harfoot shit that really just turns me off. It looks like I'm watching Robin Williams Hook. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> when I'm watching this, I'm like, bro, this is Hook. <laughs> like, this fucking looks just like that shit. It looks like shit from the 90s. <laughs> That's fair. And, and the other thing is, um, uh, uh, Arondir, that's his name, right? Yeah. All right. I don't mind him as a character, okay? But at least in this first episode, and I think maybe the second episode, which we'll get into... He just he he plays the role like he's a Vulcan. Not yeah, like he's definitely Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, no, like straight up, it's like it's perfect because he's got the pointy ears to go with it. He he acts like a Vulcan. He doesn't act like, like himself. Like you mean, kind of like Stone Cold and like no emotion kind of thing, right? And but even like okay, we'll we'll play not just Vulcan. We'll say Spock. Where, where he has that human conflict because Spock is half human. So he's kind of got some emotion that he's fighting with. But especially in the first couple episodes, he is straight up just stoic. And every once in a while, that human part leaks out. And that's not how elves are. 
Right. Elves are very emotional. Maybe they were trying to play on the fact that he's been with this company that's been watching over the Southland men for, what, like 78 years or some dumb shit? So that's right. Maybe he's lost touch yeah. with his honestly as the as the episodes went on he's like probably one of my one of my favorite yeah, characters. Yeah, he yes. absolutely gets better. Absolutely gets better and his storyline in the future is more compelling than anything else I think. Um yes, hold that thought. We were going to talk about yeah, that. We're, uh, we're going to get there. The episode. Yeah, but he uh but this this first episode for sure he doesn't play a good elf. Yeah. No, I can see that for sure. I, I think it's really hard to gauge where this show is going based off episode one. For because sure. Because I think they improve so much as the as these four episodes go continue. Absolutely. Not. Yeah. Like, very much. Like, I... I would honestly, and I'm not saying they're, they're similar in, in storylines or even quality or anything like that, but like The Witcher... Uh, I, The Witcher, if you watch season one and go to season two, if, because I did the same thing kind of like this where I did the reviews of individual episodes, the improvement from season one through season two, season two was significantly better. And it was like all my complaints that I had got fixed in season two. So I feel like, okay, I have all these complaints about like you, like y'all mentioned, like, eh, he's, he's not really all that great in this first episode, but goddamn, it's, it's almost kind of like, and, they, and this didn't happen by any means, but like steadily improved with each episode. Yeah. I agree. Especially his character for sure. So that was, uh, that was episode one, uh, a shadow of the past. I totally fucking forgot to tell you what the episode was named, but whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> shoot for the hit here, guys. <laughs> I have to commend TV shows that actually put the title of the episode in the beginning of the show because there is no way to know the name of the episode otherwise. Correct. And and just so many are like, oh yeah, this this episode here. And I'm like, all I know it is by season three, episode 10 or whatever else because they don't tell you the name in the show. You have to go afterwards. And before the internet, we didn't know these things. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> it, it it's similar to uh, like like Supernatural. Like, there's so many fucking episodes you just don't even know. Like, I say Scooby Doo episode, you just fucking know. <laughs> right. That's how it was back in the day. Hey, you know that episode where like so and so killed so and so? That's how we described it back in the day. The, the the only series that I could, if you gave me a title of an episode, I could probably tell you what it was about. Would be Buffy, and that's just because I've watched that series so many damn times. <laughs> All right, so moving on to episode two, which is titled Adrift. Uh, Nori and Poppy keep the stranger hidden from the other Harfoots and give him food and shelter. He does not speak their language, but uses fireflies and apparent magic to indicate that he is searching for a constellation of stars that Nori does not recognize. So, there might be some rhetorical questions here, okay? Just to kind of <laughs> plan this ahead of time. I have no clue how this guy really fits into the overall story. I I honestly was not expecting a guy to fucking, like, Superman, Kal-El, into the Earth over here. Uh, at first, I was assuming he was a wizard, kind of like Gandalf or something like that. Uh, but I'm not sh really sure about that anymore. Um, but I'm leaning more towards that, more so than anything. I mean, it doesn't fit uh, the timeline, but yeah. It's... What, with wizards? Yeah. Well, with a specific wizard that you mentioned, but... Oh. So Gandalf's not around during this time? No, Gandalf in Lord of the Rings shows up like a thousand years into the Third Age. We're talking about the Second Age right here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so like I said, no spoilers, but another character that he could be, and I, I'm not even saying that I necessarily 100% believe this, this is just thoughts just running through my head, like, okay, who, who could be this, he could be this, whatever. 
Tom Bombadil, maybe. I I always lean towards a wizard before Bombadil. And Bombadil... It, now, it, I'm going based off of no knowledge of the book. No knowledge so whatsoever. So, yeah, Creston's over here like... Creston's I like, did not a dumbass think thing of Tom Bombadil. Bombadil. <laughs> but um, I guess I could see him spinning that off. And honestly, I heard that uh, Bombadil is going to make an appearance in season two. Uh, through the grapevine, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I didn't, but I'm I'm with Nick. I didn't initially think it was Bombadil. I immediately went wizard. Um, either Astari, uh, one of the blue wizards, or you know Gandalf, obviously. Yeah. But um, uh, I'm, I I could see him trying to spin it to be Bombadil, maybe, maybe. But he, I mean, he's been around since you know before. Middle Earth was even formed into its current form, so. But at the same time, they, you know, they're working off of appendices, and they're kind of doing their own thing with the timeline and with uh, with the characters and stuff. So, either way, you know, I could see it. I could see it playing out. Mm -hmm. One thing, and I think I mentioned this to you yesterday. One thing I really liked the little touch they added to the show. I like when they transition to another, like like a storyline or whatever. Like, we'll say we'll go from uh, the Sundering Seas to maybe oh, Middle yeah. Earth or something like that. The maps. They will actually show the map, and that's yeah. their transition. Dude, I, look, I fucking love sm- the geography, yeah. Small little touch. Yeah. But it helps with understanding what's going on, understanding the lore. Absolutely. So I'm going to be honest. I didn't, like connect the dots there i was like fucking middle earth uh, oh 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 that's like a that's like africa okay <laughs> i need i need to uh, yes but i need them to like pan out to show the entire continent and then pan in. i think that's part of the uh the uh, the secrecy and illusion to these characters they're trying to they're trying space, to perform trying not to show how spaced out or how close together right. they are that way they're still the um there's still a chance that it's different timelines or, you know, that these characters aren't who we, who we're thinking they are. Um, which I mean, honestly, through the first four episodes, I thought the mystery was, was a nice touch. Was. I, I can't say anything further, unfortunately. Yeah. I just, I, 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 I'm not well accustomed to the middle earth map as I am to other science fiction or mythical maps. So I don't know where all these places are. Bro, <laughs> so, when, when I the Silmarillion, you talk about difficult as fuck trying to keep up. Well, and then you're talking about because much. Well, and places change names how many times? Yeah, exactly. And, and then like they'll have a war, and they're like, "Yeah, this place became completely desolated. A new fucking mountain range popped up, and they renamed it this." So it's just talk about crazy trying to keep up with. But yeah, like you were saying, Matt, I, I think the the map was a really nice touch. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it definitely helps us us noobs out a little bit, uh, a little bit more, you know. Uh, so Gilgalad sends the half elf Elrond to Region to arrest to arrest to assist the great Elven Smith, uh, Celebrimbor, who Celebrimbor. is playing to what I said. It's pronounced with a K. Celebrimbor. Oh, yeah, that's totally what I said. And it's and it's Celebrimbor. And it's Gilgalad. Gilgalad, yeah. yeah whatever. <laughs> Look, guys, I'm all, Mississippi. All, go the, fight, uh, go all the names that start with a C are pronounced with a K. Caradin, Celeborn, Celebrimbor. Mm-hmm. Fact, facts right there. You know, hey, you know, us people from Mississippi, we're gonna pronounce it how we how we how it's spelled, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, planning to build a powerful new forge. Elrond suggests that they seek help from the dwarves and goes to his friend Prince Durin the Fourth in Khazadum. Uh, Durin the Fourth is angry that Elrond has not visited in twenty years, but his wife Disa convinces him to heal. To heal, I can't fucking talk, dude. I think I had a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> to hear, <laughs> y'all got y'all got me all fucking sensitive over here. I'm talking, to... <laughs> bruh. Just you know how Caesar's. 
C's are pronounced K's, K's are pronounced S's. <laughs> it sounds like doom. <laughs> what a fucking man. <laughs> Dude, but uh, this fucking Kaz of Doom was fucking beautiful. God damn, dude. Magical. The yes. fucking waterfalls, them redirecting sunlight with the fucking reflective gems and shit. Like, oh my god. And then the, the headdresses of like, I guess, the, the King's Guard or whatever. It was just like a solid black full face fucking mask of a dwarf. Even had the fucking beard and all. That shit this was is, awesome. This is where all the all their costume design went was to the dwarves. Yeah. <laughs> right. Dude. <laughs> they knocked it out of the park too. Durin and Disa too, man. God damn. Stop. I love I, I love Disa. Mm-hmm. Kind of jumping forward, but when she's doing the singing and stuff, that was that was badass. My, my only complaint is I wish she had a beard. That would actually be awesome. Doesn't she have like a little, like a little shadow, like a little shadow stash? Yeah, a little, a little stubble, stubble. Yeah, she has some stubble. She looks like she got that five o'clock shadow going on. Yeah, <laughs> she's the prince's wife, man. She's probably fucking cleaning that shit up. <laughs> so I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play devil's advocate here, okay? <laughs> I think it's great to look at. I think the costume designs are great. Like, I'm not arguing with that by any means. But I'm not going to lie. Like, up to this point, the Harfoot stuff and then the Dwarf stuff, my least favorite shit going on. Up to this point. I will agree with you on the Harfoot stuff, man. I That's tried tough to, to get through. Uh, to watch it objectively, and I forced myself to enjoy it. And that storyline alone by itself is is not bad. But when you're, like, switching back and forth from, like, what seems like actual Middle Earth to this little fucking caravan, it kind of it kind of slows it down for me, honestly. Yep. I, I will say throwing in three, four storylines right in the beginning of the first episode, it's hard to follow. It is. You got you to gotta be ready to fucking watch. You can't have the kids running around, people asking you fucking questions. You actually got to pay attention. Shut the fuck up! I'm watching the Rings of Power. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you base it upon other TV shows that build the world out, versus this one's like, here's the whole world, and we're gonna somehow bring it all in. Uh -huh. They're kind of doing it the opposite approach, which I don't think works. Yeah, for premiere. I, I can't help but think that some of that was them trying to capture some of those disgruntled old school Lord of the Rings fans. Like, hey, look, we're doing this shit, but also check out all this other cool shit. You know? Like, it, it's actually Middle Earth. That's fair. I, I think when you look at it from that perspective, y'all have kind of taught me off the ledge a little bit here. Uh, but yeah, I, it was just... Like, I was falling asleep during it, to be honest with you. I, I just didn't really care about any anything that was going on with the dwarf stuff, other than the way it looked. Uh, but, again, these are my I opinions. knew what was waiting under that fucking mountain, so I was locked in, baby. <laughs> I, 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 I think the, the purpose of the different storylines, the four storylines, was, hey, guys, remember? We had hobbits in the movies. Here's some almost hobbits. And, hey, <laughs> We had dwarves too. Here's some dwarves also trying to bring in that. Hey, remember back when? Here's right. some more of it versus right. just starting out with a small story and slowly introducing those races that we've seen before. Yeah. They just wanted to try and draw everyone in at once. Absolutely. And as far as yeah. the Harfoots go, I can't remember who's the what's the leader's name. Uh, it starts with a Z, doesn't it? I don't remember. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got, I got the character list pulled up. Sadek. Sadek. That dude was, like, the first couple times I saw him on screen, I was like, fuck this guy, he's annoying the shit out of me. I actually kind of like that character now. This quirky, just fucking super, super uh, secretive, breaking out the old fucking scrolls, looking at <laughs> right. and shit. I'm like, okay. This guy's been fucking hitting the mushrooms. I would have preferred them had a scene where he's chowing down on some mushrooms beforehand to really get him in character. Or at least some pipe weed, you know? Right. Down for that. 
Yeah, my my thing with the Harfoots is, like I said a minute ago, I I just I think about Robin Williams and Hook when I watch them, and I'm just like, I don't know. It just it seems like I went to the store and just picked out some shit and made their outfits and shit like that. So it really turns me off. And then as of like I said, as of right now, the storyline with those characters not as exciting as everything else. Granted, everything else is just more exciting. Period. So, oh. there's that. Yeah, I, I got to agree with you. There's not a whole lot of them at this point that I, I'm i just genuinely concerned about what happens to them. It's like, ah, maybe that wolf eats them all. Uh, in the words of a great philosopher from Rocky, uh, if he dies, he dies. <laughs> I, I'm a little disappointed. You know, they were, in the first episode, they were picking berries, and she sees the wolf print, and she's like, guys, we got to get the fuck out. There's a wolf around here. And then they show the wolf, and then the wolf never shows back up again. You're right. He never fucking <laughs> he never fucking showed back up. And that's just no. a little sneakiness, sir. You, you you gave me anticipated conflict, and it never showed up. You blue balled me on this. Could have eaten at least one or two of them. Like right, you know, you ate the halfling. <laughs> if that would have happened, you'd have been locked into the hard foot. Right, right from the get go, like, oh fuck, it's the it's the halflings versus the wolves. <laughs> oh, these motherfuckers are gonna die. <laughs> All right, so swimming back to Middle Earth, Galadriel comes across a raft with human survivors of a shipwreck. They are attacked by a sea monster, and only one survives, Halbrand of the Southlands, who is fleeing from orcs. He and Galadriel work together to survive a storm. Arondir investigates tunnels beneath Hordern and is captured. Bronwyn returns to her own village uh, where an orc attacks her and Theo. Can we they just talk uh, the orcs for a second? What do you guys think about their costumes and stuff? Because I really like so, it. I, I hold enjoy on, hold on like a cunt hair of a second. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Cut her for a second. I told y'all, y'all got to reel uh, me back in, boys. <laughs> reel me in, man. <laughs> I, I, I got a quick question, though, and this, this bugs the shit out of me, and I'm just I'm full of questions. What the fuck were a bunch of humans being out there all the way almost to Val Valinor? That's a good I question. Think, were they they really that far? Yeah. I mean, Unless it was geography? really set up and Galadriel has been swimming for a year. Right. I mean, unless she swam a thousand miles before she ran into that shipwreck. But at the We're... same time, Valinor is hidden, so you could probably swim right by it and not see it or even know you're near it. Yeah, but I mean, if you zoom out on a map of middle, or a map of whatever planet they're on, whatever the name of the planet is, you got Middle Earth, you've got Numenor, and then you've got Valinor over here. Touche. The sun so, is very Numenor, we'll, we'll shift the map. You got Numenor and Valinor. <laughs> and they're, the shipwreck is like right here. <laughs> Sir, whatever you're doing to your finger over there is uh, <laughs> it's teasing me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I thought she was, I thought it was like kind of like Game of Thrones where they just zoomed forward a little bit and she just swam a a shit ton of miles by the way now they pruned up she's she's got that swimmer v body going on now because she's been swimming for a thousand miles <laughs> hey bro calm down calm <laughs> <laughs> ain't nobody talking shit about galadriel on this fucking podcast okay <laughs> <laughs> that's what Kristen says no matter who's playing her <laughs> Chris was like, look, y'all talked all kinds of shit during the Hobbit trilogy, and I allowed it. I'm uh -huh. not going to fucking allow this. I'm putting my foot down. <laughs> all right. So, yes, the orc attack attacks them. Uh, they kill it, convince the rest of the town, including Waldrig, the tavern owner, to leave. I like this fight. It's a good fight. It's a good fight. It was good because it was gritty. They were resourceful. It wasn't like just uh... – Oh, they team up and, and beat it with pans or whatever else like that. Like they're grabbing whatever the fuck they can to do any amount of damage to this thing. So to Creston's question earlier, how do we feel about the orcs, correct? Yes. Headdresses, outfits, weapons, fucking fingernails, faces. God damn. 
the fucking designs look fantastic. Oh, and, that, and I like how they went, I, I like how they went original. They oh, didn't try and mimic. Yeah, can't even be on the fucking sun orcs. But but we'll get to that because I have a complaint. I I don't know. I don't know if it's a complaint. It's just a I guess a question that I had about that in comparison yes. to the OG trilogy. Yes, we'll, and we'll get to that in in future episode. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm talking about the you talking about the sunlight. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'll save my question for later. <laughs> so, really like the design. Um, the whole skull for mask. Originally, I was like, why the fuck are they giving give them skulls for masks? Like, like I'm not complaining. It looks fucking cool, but why? You know, especially when you come from the uh, the OG trilogy, you're like, I mean, they didn't get cool shit like that. <laughs> what the fuck? And then. A future spoiler for a, an episode. I think it's next episode, actually. Uh, it's not really a spoiler, but it, this answers the question of why they actually have the skull for mask and they have that the wardrobe and shit like that. It's to block the sunlight. Uh, it burns them and shit like that. Right. And the the orc design kind of gave me flashbacks of Warcraft orcs and trolls and goblin design. Yeah. Where they had that more primitive battlement. Yeah. Very, very primitive. I, I I'm saying I fucking I fucking re I was I was I remember looking at the like the they had released like the still pictures before the show came out of the uh, the orcs and I was like, Okay, they have skull mass. I mean looks fine. How does it look and what's the point of it in, in the show? And then when it actually happens in the show, you're like, nah, oh, this is pretty fucking dope. I'm not gonna lie, this is pretty <laughs> fucking dope. <laughs> Especially like Dutch. not even not even from like a costume standpoint of what they're wearing, but like the makeup and the design, like the faces and shit like that, spot the fuck on, man. No, they did great. And, and then, then even like their fingernails and their movements. Yes. Like even the way like he was fighting inside that house was very not man like, very more animalistic. Yeah. Brutal. Yes, like super dirty is this kind of with, the, with the fingernails and, and shit like that. Now, one question I did have. We didn't necessarily get this in the OG trilogy or even in the Hobbit trilogy from what I remember. Did they just all of a sudden become fucking superhuman here? And they're like, they're throwing people across the, across the whole goddamn house. I'm like, did they are they been bodybuilding or some shit? Like what the fuck? Well, I mean, I guess those orcs are only battling just regular humans, so they would be significantly stronger than them. Think okay, of it so more. That's, that's more. That's like okay. That's what I was. I was like, is this based on anything in the actual? They're books they're or corrupted. Like yeah. Well, think of them more as like more primitive. So, like you look at the ape species which are the ape family like which humans are involved you know are part of and compare us to like a chimp or a gorilla they're going to kick our ass every time right they're more primitive might not be significantly bigger but significantly stronger i got you so yeah definitely keep my uh question for the uh, sunlight for a later episode uh, but overall, the episode two, uh, some big swings, some misses to me. To me, out of the out of the four episodes that we're reviewing, this is the weakest one to me. Uh, I don't know how y'all feel about that. The the stuff with the meteor man and the Harfoots and the dwarves are some of the weaker story stuff going on right now. Really invested in Arndir and Bronwyn's storyline. Like this story, this episode really kind of grasped me, and like I'm definitely invested in that storyline. Yeah. And, with that being said, if I had to have a small complaint about their storyline, I just I wish they had more time to develop that relationship a bit before shit starts going down. Or right. maybe while it's going down, let's let's develop that relationship a little bit more. Uh anything else y'all want to say before we head on to episode three? Um uh, the the cow being milked with that black sludge. Fucking disgusting, and I loved every bit of it. Oh god. <laughs> 
I wanted to just taste it, just to see what it tastes like, you know? <laughs> you got to. <laughs> just give me a little, little, little taste. I want to tell Is you. this chocolate syrup? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's like when you uh you have your you have your kid you're like, all right, does he, you gotta do the you gotta do the finger test. Is this chocolate or is this shit more than two? Well, and I liked how whenever uh he was walking into the tavern in the first episode, and before he walks in, they're kind of talking about this blighted patch of grass, and then it leads into that at the end of the episode at the beginning of the first episode, the second episode whatever it leads into oh the cow went east and that's where that blighted patch of grass was at was east mm-hmm. so a little bit of a little bit of foreshadowing into the storyline but not like a direct hey this is where we're gonna go that's fair moving on to episode three Adar uh, this episode starts off with kind of like an orc concentration camp of sorts, uh, where the orcs are using humans to do all their their work. Um, I think this is good. Gives us a different view of the orcs from the OG trilogy to to this one. Uh, I am still in favor of the skull mask, and they fucking look great. And it builds some intrigue here with the elves being captured. Wasn't fucking expecting that shit. Uh, so yeah, I, I think this whole storyline right here and how it's kind of evolved uh, rather quickly, if anything. Uh, very much like, hey, let's go back to that storyline. Like, I'm, I want to see more shit of that. Well, and this is... Okay, go with your question first. The other elves that were captured uh, digging the trench, that was his commanding officer that he was talking to on top of the tower, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I thought so. Okay. Here's my complaint with this scenario, though. They're building not a tunnel with these elves' help. They're building a trench and covering the tu- the trench with fabric or whatever to block out the sun. Okay? Why dig a trench when you can just wrap a tunnel above the ground? Uh... Valid point, especially since they, <laughs> especially since they already tunneled in the towns. Right, they were they were in the town underground. They didn't build a trench and just cover it up with hides because he would have seen that. So they were digging tunnels, but now they're just digging a trench. Maybe because they needed quicker transport, a wider path. And then we talk about orcs not being able to tolerate sunlight, but then. They just walk out from underneath of the shaded area with no problems and beat the shit out of the elves, and they're not hiding from the sun. There was a small sunscreen. cloud in front of it. The, the, yeah, the cloud screen showing the camera. <laughs> <laughs> that was my complaint. Where it's just like they're building tunnels and they're building a trench and covering it, but then the orcs just run out and wreck shit, and then. Nothing happens, and then Arondir later on breaks down the tarp, and all of a sudden, now the sun's an issue. Well, one of them, one of the interactions with the orcs, they were saying, you've been out in the sun so long, your skin's going to char black. So it kind of, to me anyways, it sounded more like it takes extended um, exposure to the sunlight. But at the same time, when they run into the tree line, they fucking... Went yeah, right. in this episode, they get to the tree line and they're like, oh, no, can't go any further. The trees are done. So there's an inconsistency in the the, the light thing. Touche. Touche. Yeah. What about the uh, warg? A little Fucking... different from the wargs we used to know. More wolfy? I, More I, I, I didn't care for it. God damn, those fucking... I hated the eyes. The eyes look nothing like the rest of the body. Well, the eye was more puppy dog. Very circular. It was almost like human like. Yeah. Like it, it reminds me of like googly eyes. The way it was. My everything else about the about the war was, was pretty cool. Uh but the eyes just I don't know, if I had to nitpick it, 
that'd be the one thing. I'm like, ah, that kind of looks dumb, to be honest. Definitely the first thing I noticed was those fucking eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, so Gladriel and Halbrand are picked up by a ship contained, oh, uh, captained by Elendil. He takes them to Numenor, an island kingdom ruled by men descended from Elrond's brother, Elros. Uh, let me just fucking say, guys, this was the fucking money shot right here, okay? This is where a lot of that fucking budget went to because <laughs> Numenor yeah, looked fucking yeah. incredible, okay? The buildup of where are they being taken to? 100% earned here, okay, because they give you that payoff by showing the whole goddamn kingdom in this wide shot. Dude, the pan and, Goddamn. Yeah, the, the, the pan Mid out and everything. Fucking steroids. Yes. Yes, that, that was the first thing that I thought about. Uh, the camera work here is really good. Adds a lot to the scene. And like I said, they, they spent a lot of fucking money on this sequence. Uh, one other thing that I want to note, uh, want to mention... Um, I, I understand why, okay? I understand why she's wearing a gown here, okay? I'm, I'm talking shit about your, your character here, Creston. I'm sorry. Uh, I get it. It was underneath the armor, and she took it off. She jumped ship and shit like that, okay? Fucking get it. Not complaining about why she's wearing it or anything like that, but I can't help but think about Rose in the Titanic when her fucking walking around in that goddamn nightgown, Okay? I'm thinking she's going to fucking drop a necklace in the fucking ocean and say, come back, Jack, <laughs> all of a sudden. It needed it needed to be trimmed down a little bit more form-fitting because it really was just... It was a bed sheet. <laughs> it was a bed sheet. Honestly, I forgot about her wearing the gown when she jumped in the water or whatever, and I legit thought that the, one of the sailors just gave her something to put on because she didn't have any clothes to wear. That would have made more sense. Actually, I mean, and then when you get to the island, hey, guys, can, can we give me fucking something different than this goddamn gown, please? I look fucking ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so relations between the island and the elves have grown strained, and Queen Regent Muriel des denies Gladriel's request for a ship back to Middle Earth. Uh Let's see, I'm just looking at my notes real quick. Uh, did did uh, Galadriel's behavior to the Queen Regent seem a little off-putting to you? Yes, but I, I just thought this was like the start of her arc, to be to be honest with you, because I have, that's one of my notes here. I'm like, she has this like no bullshit, get the job done at any kind of cost type of attitude. Well, and, and she also this... doesn't feel humbled at all for her life being saved or anything it's just like i'm here you're gonna do what i say because you owe us definitely a stark difference between the galadriel that we see and lost lorian from lord of the rings which i get yes. because i mean this takes place four thousand years before lost lorian right I mean, if if I was going to nitpick it, I could definitely find some some problems I have with your character as far as parallels with uh, the story from the books. But overall, I just think that it showed, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not haste, but uh, time is of the essence. Urgency. Urgency, that's what I was looking for, yeah. Just a sense of urgency because she knew the the dire need that was happening in the Southlands, or thought that she did. So we also get a name drop of Isildur right here, okay? <laughs> who is the son of the captain that captured Gladriel and Halbrand. Um, so I think this is a good time to go through some of the lore and history of Lord of the Rings and kind of help everybody connect the dots here. And this is what I, I had texted Creston about uh, originally. So Aragorn from the OG trilogy... And y'all correct me if I'm wrong here. Descendant of a race of men known as the Numenorians who found favor with the god of uh, of the universe after they fought against Morgoth in the First Age. Uh, this is the place where Gladriel and Halbrand are at currently, which is Numenor. Uh, Isodor eventually kills Sauron, which is the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring. He takes the One Ring for himself and eventually is killed. 
Isildur and his three oldest sons die uh, towards the back end of that uh, prologue. Uh, Aragorn is related to Isildur through Valendil, Isildur's fourth son. And it's kind of like a great, 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 great grandfather to Aragorn. Uh, obviously, there's there's several more people in between them two, but uh, that's just kind of for me. That was just easiest thing to to kind of connect the dots. Like, okay, how did how was Isildur and Aragorn connected in the OG trilogy again? So I had to go through here and kind of map it out a little bit, and that was the the easiest way that I understood it. It gets even more complicated than that because Isildur and his brother ruled the human race jointly. And Isildur ruled the... Uh, Miss Anor. Yeah, uh, which was like pretty much where the Rangers are now in Lord of the Rings. And his brother actually ruled um, Minas Tirith and Gondor. Yeah. Yeah. Gilead and Minas so, Tirith. So really when you go down to it, Aragorn was never by blood lineage actually the true ruler of Gondor. He's also Elrond's great, 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 like ten greats nephew. So him and Arwen are like tenth cousins. Which I mean by Alabama standards that's so legal. Right? <laughs> right? We're fucking good to go, motherfucker. <laughs> Uh, so Gadriel also learns that Halbrand, who is imprisoned after fighting some Numenorians, is heir to the throne of the Southlands. So uh, we get a little fight with Halbrand and some of those guys. Uh, Nick, did you pass out from uh, Halbrand <laughs> breaking the old dude's one, wrist the, during that fight? Yeah, oh God! <laughs> uh, as soon as it happened, I was like, "Oh God!" I can. I, Nick straight up passed out when he saw this. Yeah, the the left nut sucked up inside of me. <laughs> Dude's got some, some some hands though. He does. You know, the whole scene I was I was like, okay, they're teasing something where where he he I don't know, is is almost like he was he was mysterious and he has something he's not telling people and then he just farks he just fucking throws hands and they I catch him. Did, right. did you actually did you actually see him steal the coin off of him? Yes. It took me th this third watch paying attention to his hands because I wasn't even like watching it, but I just noticed his hand on the shoulder and watch him go just and lift it right off. And I'm like, that's sneaky. Fuck. He actually did steal it on, on camera. <laughs> uh, so Gladriel visits a library of lore with Elendil and discovers that the Mark of Sauron is actually a map of the Southlands where a new realm for evil forces is planned. Uh, Halbrand's arc so far is is interesting and engaging to me. Uh, he's kind of like, and again, y'all just y'all bear with me when I say this. Uh, he's kind of like an Aragorn type character for for the show, uh, or as a philosopher so eloquently once said on a previous episode, Dollar Tree Aragorn. Uh, but again, that's not a knock against him. It's just it's Aragorn. Okay, he is. You, you, have, a, you have a lot to live up to. He seems more sinister. Not genuine. E, I, I, I don't know if sinister would be the word I would use. Mysterious. I don't know. It seems like he's hiding something. Too. This guy seems to have a darkness in him. Yeah, he, he doesn't seem mysterious like Aragorn or Stryker was. Versus this guy just doesn't seem like he's going to play nice. I, I mean, I had my, my thoughts on Halbrand as soon as he showed up. So, I, my mind was already in other places. It He was the one that told them who he was, right? He's the one that told Gladriel that he was Halbrand? Right. Yeah. So, initially, and I still kind of have this doubt about his character. I, I guess you I guess you could say that now that I'm thinking about it, he's probably is a little more sinister than I than I originally thought. I I, I originally thought, especially uh, when she discovers who he is, I was thinking 
maybe he was making that shit up and he wasn't actually Halbrand. I can give you that. And then it just seems all like this one episode seems very convenient that she finds the, the pendant around his neck and then makes the trip to the library and immediately finds that sigil with the pendant. And it's like, Oh, well he's, he's the King of the Southlands or he's, you know, supposed to be the King of the Southlands at the same time that he also finds the Mark of Sauron's actually a map to the Southlands. Uh, all, as the Harfoots. That, that's all a lot of coincidence at once. It, it, it is a lot. This, the map, <clears throat> like the sigil, and then they showed like the map. Did y'all notice that the map was the, the mountain range? I did the second they showed the mountain range. It wasn't, it was during one of the scene cuts. Yeah. That I saw it, and I'm like, well, that looks like the fucking sigil turned sideways. Yeah. And then. Yeah, it was. It yeah, was I, I didn't catch it until she actually said it. Over it. But I yeah. was like, fuck up. I was like, wait a second, there, there's the sigil right there on the fucking map. It's mountains. <laughs> <laughs> That's when she's looking at it, she just goes, huh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as the Harfoots prepare for their seasonal migration, the stranger is revealed to them all while trying to read some star maps. Uh, they let him join them, and he pushes Nori's wagon since her father is injured. Uh, okay. Arondir and his and they're playing with my fucking testicles by breaking the father's ankle <laughs> right I... this dude just get it back to back in this what, episode. so like were y'all thinking that like he's trying to figure out his magic and like accidentally broke that dude's ankle or was it strictly coincidence that he's drawn with the stick and snaps it and the dude's ankle snaps because uh, uh, uh... like like he did that like accidentally because he had he had done the uh, the fireflies before to make the constellation, and then got weak, and they all fucking died. I I know they were trying to play it on as oh shit he pulsed and broke his leg. <laughs> right, <laughs> I had a surge. I'm sorry. Right, <laughs> I I get the I get that was what they were going for. I didn't I didn't necessarily get it as much as it was. Nori was somewhere else instead of helping her dad. And he tried to do it all by himself, and he needed the help, and she wasn't there, and he wasn't strong enough to do it by himself, and his leg like, snapped. And the stranger took it. And that, or he. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think the stranger had any play in it. I think that was just a correlation, not a causation. I got. Arondir and his elven compatriots stage a revolt and are killed during an attempted prison revolt. Arondir is taken to the leader of the orcs who they call Adar, which means father. Uh, look, if you're going to name your goddamn episode Adar, he better not be at the very fucking end and all you do is see his face and then you cut the episode, okay? Well, so they... The biggest complaint of the goddamn series so far. But they mentioned him. A lot. They, yeah. they fucking mentioned him. Multiple yes. times and they kept on saying Adar, Adar and the elves the entire time were like, who is this Adar person, and why are orcs using an elvish word for their person? Right, they all thinking like it's another name for Sauron when they were talking in the trench and shit. So, yes. So that's... I, I, I don't want to future spoil anything, because I, I, I don't honestly know this, but I feel like I saw pictures of who they said or who they think Sauron is in the show. And I don't remember him looking like this from that picture that I saw. But I don't remember. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. So I can't spoil anything. I was thinking Adar was Sauron. They're definitely so again, trying to allude to that, I feel like. I felt like that, it was easy, though. Yeah, I think I think they're trying to yeah. trick us thinking of Sauron. Yeah. But he is he is a, a shapeshifter, so he can take on the form of an elf, a human, a fucking beast. So I So while we're on the subject, because technically this happens in episode four, okay? Uh but since we're on the subject of Adar and possible Sauron being possibly the uh the connection there, the the actual character. Um 
the thing that really attracts me to the fact that it could be Sauron is Adar mentions that he wants to be a god. Yeah, I'm not a god, at least not yet. Not yet. At least not yet. Yeah. And I'm like, I was a badass. That's, that's a badass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I mean, that sounds like something Sauron would say. <laughs> At this point, I am fully vested to. I want to know more about Adar. I am ready for him. I want to see some backstory. Yeah. I'm, I'm the invested dude in that character. Fucking too. Dope. His that, design. Is that the makeup. same guy that plays uh, Benjen? I think so. Now that you mention that, he it just good. it just clicked. Yeah. No, I I never made that connection before. Hold on. God, Ooh. I hope so. Please let it be Uncle Benjamin. Benjamin from Game of Thrones. Yeah, Uncle Benji, north of the wall. Re- re- uh, oh, oh, maybe it is. Oh fuck yeah! I didn't even I didn't even connect the dots there. He's a White Walker. That's what he is. He ain't Sauron. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a White Walker. He's something else. He's something else. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, not to spoil anything further, but like like I said, we're already on the subject. the The stuff with the Dar is easily the stuff that I am most invested in with the entire show up to this point. And we just we only get one scene with him. He they do such a fucking fantastic job of building that intrigue with one character in just one scene. And honestly, I I don't know of many many shows or movies that can just build a character within one particular scene and make you like, "Hey, can we get more shit of him?" Like that that dude was pretty fucking cool. Mm-hmm. So, just everything that he brings to the table, I am 100% there for. And and another good thing about him is they they do a good job of making him like, humanizing him in a way because he actually cares for the orcs and shit like that, which I was not expecting. The way yeah. that he was that the end of three or the beginning of four when he that's, that's the beginning of four. Okay, was it when, when he put that yeah, so three, a... three ends when he walks up to yeah, uh, Okay, so For... then the floor is where he puts the orc out of its mer- misery. Yes. Okay. So all this, ha- all that that we're just talking about right now happens at the very beginning of four. Okay. Uh, but to finish off episode three, uh, I feel as though the series is really starting to find its footing uh, with this particular episode. Pretty invested in all the storylines. Granted, like I said, the Harfoot storyline, weakest element of the show so far. Um, but the but like I've already mentioned, I think the I show is really teaching me a lot about the lore and the world of Lord of the Rings, which I really appreciate. Like I'm Googling shit. And I will say this, I do believe that this is basically Lord of the Rings uh, Game of Thrones version. And especially when they get to Numenor. Like <laughs> that was that's some Game of Thrones <laughs> shit right there. That it sure, uh, looks a lot better, but it looks uh it's Game of Thrones. I, I told uh Creston uh when they first showed Numenor, I'm like, I got Bravo's vibes. Yes. Yeah. Birds flying, water, big sails in the air, lots of stonework. All right. Episode four, The Great Wave. Muriel refuses to help defend the Southlands and has Gladriel imprisoned. Adar releases Arndir with a message for the Southlanders. Uh, and that's where we would we would have discussed all the shit about him. Uh, Theo returns t- for supplies and is attacked by orcs who are searching for the broken Sword. Can I Elrond just? Elrond learns that Theo is probably my least favorite character. I don't know why. Dude's just fucking annoying. And that little hilt, the the sword hilt, is badass. I thought that badass. was a nice touch, like one, like a weapon that Morgoth made for them to fight alongside them. You know, for the men, how it draws their blood out and creates that fucking flame and blade. Well, and you know, and they, they've always kind of hint, or they haven't always, but since the orcs have made their presence known in the villages, it's kind of been hinted at they're looking for something. Yeah, like they're searching. Because the tunnels aren't like, 
aren't like well known. They're like kind of secretive, like they're sneaking in, sneaking out type shit. And they're 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 looking for something, and then finally they confront him, and he's got the hilt, and it's just that aha moment. Right, I fucking it's found the it. boy. He's got it. Wait, so the hilt is a weapon for the men. Yes. Not well, for Sauron. Well, the wow. the the hilt they, they haven't alluded to what it is yet. Uh, yeah, I guess well, so. Yeah. Right. And right now it's just the thing that the orcs have been looking for. Gotcha. I guess we'll wait to to find that answer out. Uh the hilt fucking awesome though. Yeah. Uh Elrond learns that Durin has been mining a powerful new ore, Mithril, and promises to keep his sec- keep the secret. Uh, Gladriel escapes prison and goes to the tower of King Tar Plantar, uh, who is in ill health. Meryl explains that there was a rebellion because the king wanted to renew the relations with the elves, and Meryl was placed on the throne. This gave her access to a uh, plantier, uh, which is aka a crystal ball of some sorts, uh, that showed her a vision of Numenor being destroyed in a great tsunami. So, one thing that I need cleared up here. I've always been confused. I, I'm kind of confused by this. I always thought that was an object related to Sauron. Almost kind of like a like a Horcrux of sorts. That's my second fucking Harry Potter reference on this goddamn episode. Uh, <laughs> I'm not mad at it. Uh, but this episode also m- makes reference to that there are several of these things around the world. I thought there was only one. Seven, mm-hmm. correct? Seven, yeah. yeah. Like six or seven, yeah. Yeah. So were they, were, Dragon Balls. Were, they were They were made, Yeah, they were made by an elf, right? Yeah, I think either Feanor or Celebrimbor made them. And they were... Because Feanor was the great smith. Yeah. Um, but see, this is the part that confuses me: is the 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 mythos between, but behind the the palantirs, is because like in the Lord of the Rings books, they are more like um, a scene. They're more like telescopes, where you look in the direction of another one and you can see what that palantir is seeing. Yeah. Then the movies kind of change it up to where it's more of like a crystal ball. Yeah. And this one kind of also puts off that crystal ball-esque future telling type thing. Yeah. I got to say, though, I really like how they went with the the Palantir on this. I I get it. And I just I'm okay with it being more of a crystal ball versus more of a telescope. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely along there with y'all. I was just, I was confused because in the OG trilogy, it's like they touch it and they're like, oh my god, Sauron fucking knows where you're at now, and it's just like, well, okay, it was. But that's not. Good. So how did Sauron? What he captured like, the one uh, from what Minas Lilith? Me, no, from uh, it, it was either um, Minas Morgul. I think, or Osgiliath. Yeah, I think it was Menace Morgul. Um, and then, so, in the book, there are four of them that are known to still exist. The one from, or no, three of them. Newman, the one from Newman that they're looking at is at the bottom of the fucking sea. Right, yeah. There's one that's at um, Linden, still, if I'm not mistaken. The one that Sauron has the one that Saruman has, and then in the book, Denethor has one also. Yeah. Old fucking Denethor. And that's what turned Denethor crazy, was that he would spend all night and all day staring at the Palantir, and Sauron was tricking his mind into seeing things. He was showing him how he was going to whoop that ass. Yeah. Right? (laughs) (laughs) It was Fucking uh, fucking tomatoes, man. <laughs> That's what you were showing him. God damn. I've been t- seeing I've been seeing some uh some dank tomato memes on the Lord of the Rings Facebook groups. <laughs> they do go hard with those memes. If you can wade through all the shit and shit talk. <laughs> <laughs> 
So Muriel believes Galadriel will bring this about. Uh, the message Adar gave to Arn Arondir is revealed to be forsake their claim to the area and swear fealty to him or be destroyed. Arondir what a power says, move, too, huh? Do what? I said, what a power move. He, like, captures one of the fucking elven soldiers and just like, hey, bro, I'm just going to probably let you go. Just let them know I'm coming. And I'm bringing this fucking dick with me, son. Y'all better be ready. <laughs> right? <laughs> I tell you what, I'm not carrying a sword, I promise you that, okay? <laughs> I'm carrying this big dick. <laughs> uh, Arondir saves uh, Theo from the orcs. Uh, Waldrig tells Theo that the sword is a gift for men from Sauron. Well, uh, again, can I, we, let's stop right here, the Theo scene, when he's trying to escape. I love scenes like this, where it's the long shot, and this long shot was fucking awesome. Dude, I'm a dick rider for long takes. <laughs> or the camera's just kind of following them through the town. That's a long take, yeah. And that was perfect because it was just one camera following him through this entire scene. And, I mean, you're talking about, hey, it was, what, two or three minutes worth of footage? How many times do you think they had to make that take? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. They worked hard on that fucking scene, and it was perfect. But uh, I love the teasing of Sauron throughout the series so far. I don't feel like we really even need a face to him at this point. I know I, I still think that Adar is probably the the obvious choice at this point, I, and I think that's going to end up not being the case when it's all said and done. Uh but Sauron, they got him as a very much like a, a Thanos type of, of character right now where he's kind of off in the, the background and people know about him, but uh, he, he's not really making his uh, making his presence known just yet. Well, and it's really uh, so reminiscent. That. It's really reminiscent of the movies too, where in the movie, Sauron was never a physical being. He was more of just a entity. So he wasn't ever really there, but he was there. Yeah, right. And that's kind of... I'm trying to avoid spoilers, sir. Well, and that's kind of how, <laughs> at this point, it's... Juan could be anybody or nobody at this point. To build off of that, uh, just because you said he wasn't a physical being, I'm really excited to see what they do with Numenor. And how they how they play that out in the seasons. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I'm I'm gonna stop. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> really back in. Really back in. <laughs> uh, so the petals of Numenor's white tree begin to fall, and Muriel sees this as a sign from the Valar, Valar, and instead decides to accompany Galadriel to the Southlands. And that concludes episode number four. So, hold hold up. Giving overall thoughts of the episode. What was that, Creston? Hold up. We. You just you you didn't enjoy the dwarfs from episode two, so you're just skipping over it. <laughs> uh, there, there's there's some shit. There. They they start beginning to uh, build the forge here. No, 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 when they were down in the mines and they they collapsed, right? Yeah, yeah, and you got the 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 gutty the rocks, thing. and then uh the the interaction between during the third and during the fourth. Where he's like, uh, trust your instincts. And he's like, what are they telling you? He's like, something else is going on. He's like, fuck yeah, dude. That's what I'm talking about. And I go to Linden. <laughs> yeah, he goes, you might be best friends with Elrond. But there's some shady shit going on that you don't know about. And he might not know about. But somebody the fuck knows about. Right. That was a, that was a good uh, kind of look into their relationship. Like both of them behind the scenes are like, trying to uh you know steer each other in certain directions but they're also friends you know yeah uh i'm, I'm i apologize for skipping right over it that's all right sir fuck my, the, fuck in myself. Mines, finding mithril and shit bro we know it's down there <laughs> uh but yes i i do think i i started getting more invested in that in that storyline with this particular episode especially when him and his his father are just like Bruh. They're they're being sneaky right now, okay? They're being sneaky sneaky. 
they they set it up well too because it was like there was a, a rift between him and his dad and then he goes in there swallows his pride apologizes and zad's like nah nothing to apologize about i'm always on your fucking side but also your boy elron is up to some sneaky shit it's like I, yeah, I, i'm feeling that too yeah and there was a little bit of change in the dwarven histories we'll say uh, in the TV show, based upon at this point, um, so the name Durin is pretty much like the title of Caesar in the Roman Empire, where the the next king doesn't become Durin the Fourth until after the previous Durin dies, and so like like that's the like more title that gets passed. I forgot mm-hmm. if that was uh, the initial scene with his dad or if that was this one. But they kind of talked about that, didn't they? Well, they do. And they, they talk about, you know, when one king dies, the knowledge from that king and all the former kings get passed on. But right. in addition to that, it's also the name Durin gets passed on. Right. So, so right now, Durin the Fourth shouldn't be called Durin the Fourth. He should be called a different name. Yeah. And I think uh, in the Dwarven histories, there's only supposed to be, what, seven Durins? That sounds right. There, there, there's some, there's some prophecy about, um, the the seventh Durin will bring like the apex of the door of the Dwarven nations or the fall of the Dwarven nations, something like that. But we're we're at the halfway mark, pretty much of the door of the Dwarf race. Uh, so yeah, uh, I I don't really have much to. I, I I was I was watching this episode in between running calls. Like I would watch like five minutes of it and then run a call. Watch five five minutes of it, run a call, and I'm like, God that's damn, the dude, fucking dude. worst, man. It is. Like, God damn. I do have to I, say, I, I love Disa. Me too. Disa, who? Disa. I like that. Disa, nuts, boy. Yeah, it's my boy Crescent caught on. I knew you were going with. I just, I just couldn't follow up with it. No, she honestly, I, I, I've, I've really enjoyed her as a character. Yeah, she definitely brings more life to the dwarf race. Yes, I, I will actually agree with that. Uh, so yeah, overall, this was a solid episode. Still better than the second episode by far. Uh, like I said, second episode is wasn't very, wasn't all that great to me. Uh, it was good. And it was enjoyable, but uh, in terms of the other three episodes, eh, pales in comparison. Uh, this definitely felt like one of those mid-season premiere type episodes where we're, okay, we're starting to address a lot of the conflicts. You know, the first four episodes pretty much set the table, and I'm assuming five through eight, dinner served, boys, okay? like that. This is where shit's going to start going down. Um, really, really enjoying the show so far, and I'm kind of pissed at myself for kind of skimping on it uh, halfway through episode two, which, again... I liked episode two the least, so I pissed at myself for, for skipping at it on so early. Uh, but I'm pretty much invested in all the storylines up, up to this point, with the exclusion of maybe Meteor Man and uh, the Harfoots. But I think as the show continues, I, I, I can see my interest kind of gain a little bit more traction there. All right, uh, so you haven't, else, seen, you haven't seen Five and On yet? No, I have not. Okay. So, I'm going to posit this. At this point, who do you think is Sauron? Or is he even <laughs> in the show yet? Honestly, I, if I had to guess, I think it's going to be the the obvious answer that they want you to think. It, Adar fits the bill to me. Uh, he but makes the comment that he wants to be a god and or... He's not a god yet. Uh, he just has that persona to me to be Sauron. Okay. So, so uh, you're leaning towards Adar being Sauron. I, or is that what you want the show to tell you? I think that's what the show wants you to believe. Okay, but what do you believe? I don't think Sauron is here yet. Okay. And then next question. From the, the current conflicts... How do you? Th- what do you think the finale will be about? What you mean? 
Okay, right. well, uh, we're halfway through the season. We have, what, three conflicts going on? What do you think? Uh, what do you think the show, the season's going to end on? I honestly hadn't even thought that far. I don't think they're they're not going to settle the the Sauron shit in season one. I think that is a White Walker season seven kind of thing, uh, further down the road thing. Are uh, you th- you think we're going to figure out who the Meteor Man is? I think we'll get answers to that more so than anybody else. I wouldn't be surprised if at the very end of this season, the final fucking shot is a glimpse of Sauron. Okay. Of who he actually is. I I think that was what's going to happen. But I think they're going to pull, like I said, they're going to pull a lot from Game of Thrones in this sense. Uh, Because, I mean, fuck, it worked so well for Game of Thrones up to the last fucking season. You think think they're going to pull a Phantom Menace? Between uh, Yoda and uh, Samuel L. Jackson talking at the very end and go, you know, who's the master and who's the apprentice? And then pans over to Palpatine. <laughs> and it's like, ah, it was him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think they'll be more a little more forward than that. Like, I, I legitimately think the last shot of season one is going to be, hey, Sauron. And he's fucking back. <laughs> and then, like again, I, I think they're just gonna tease him here, here and there. But he ain't gonna fucking show up for for a few seasons. I I would assume. Um, I I I, just, I would be surprised if they if they showed him more than that in this season. With them trying to build out a complete series, like I don't feel like anything with Sauron gets solved in season one. Um, like I said, I think they want you to think Adar is Sauron, but I don't, I think that's just too obvious at this point. So I think that conflict will get solved at the very end, or maybe even they continue that into season two. Can't wait to see you in two weeks. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I'm excited guys. I'm I'm going to start watching it. (laughs) Hey, that, that, that was the great thing about, uh, like I said, uh, before we even started the uh, the episode, when we when we did the the deep dive into Xenoblade Chronicles two, I had all these answers, and Chris is just like, "This motherfucker just doesn't even know, right. doesn't even know." <laughs> <laughs> but guys, that is going to be it from us. That caps off uh, the first four episodes. So go ahead and get ready. Watch episodes five through eight. Uh, two weeks from now, we will recap, dive in deep, balls deep at that going to be super excited to uh to finally have some some answers to some of our questions hopefully hopefully anyways uh so go ahead and be prepared for that uh gentlemen thank you for joining me always a pleasure always uh and we will catch y'all next time on another episode laters till your mama said hi